but I've always believed in the power of business. And I believe that one of the great ways to be selfless is to be selfish. The Gary Vee Audio Experience. Vayner Nation, how are you? It's Gary. Uh, I miss all of you. As you know, I have not been doing a lot of original interview uh, podcasts during this pandemic. I've been head down with uh, operating Vayner X uh, during this time and more recently have been uh, super head down on my Friends project, my new NFT project uh, that is just hitting the scene. But um, I had a pre-call with this gentleman who I'm gonna introduce in a second and it was just so clear to me that our ideologies really, really mapped and and he caught me at a great time. We caught, we spoke while I was in California drawing my V friends and writing the words empathetic elephant and kind this and 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 passionate that and in sympathy and curiosity and many 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 things around leadership. And while I've been writing a new book that comes out in November, and as this distinguished gentleman was speaking, I was like, wow, we really see the world the same way. And I think we're also in a place where we both want this way to be the way. So without further ado, I'm gonna let him introduce himself and tell you a little bit about his new book that I couldn't be more excited for many of you to read. I know the Vayner Nation tends to buy up the books of the few authors I ever put on here, so I I think this one's gonna hit for you because I know this audience extremely well. But without further ado, how are you? Yes, Gary. It seems that we may be brothers from a, maybe from a different brother, mother, but uh, such a good feeling. So my name is Hubert. I'm Hubert Jolie. I, up until uh, a few months ago, I was chairman and CEO of Best Buy, where together with my uh, wonderful team, we led this uh, delightfully amazing and surprising uh, resurgence uh, of Best Buy. And I studied a new life. I'm now a professor at uh, Harvard Business School, but importantly this author of this book, The Heart of Business, Leadership Principles for the Next Era of Capitalism. And, and, Gap- and say, that, say that one more time because I want people to really hear the title of the book. So it's The Heart of Business, Leadership Principles for the Next Era of Capitalism. Hmm. Love it. And, and I think that we, we indeed need, need a new era, right? Because what is striking to so many of us, right, is the world we live in, uh, is not working well, right? We have, of course, a health crisis, but also economic crisis, societal crisis, systemic racism, environmental crisis, geopolitical tensions. Uh, and what's the definition of madness, Gary, right? Doing the same thing and hoping for a different outcome. And I think that uh, so many things that we've been doing are, are not working. So through the years, and in particular, through the experience of leading this turnaround and resurgence, I've become convinced that there's a better formula for the world. I think most of us agree with it, but I'll simply articulate it. It's the idea that at the heart of business, there's the idea of pursuing a noble purpose, business being a force for good. It's about placing people at the center and creating an environment where you can unleash human magic, embracing all stakeholders in some kind of declaration of interdependence, and treating profit as an outcome, but not the goal, right? When we think about our lives, it's not about making money, that's an outcome. It's about being a force for good. And what I felt, Gary, is that while certainly following the pandemic, most people now embrace these ideas. I think all of us are travelers on this journey, eager to let go of the old way and learn how to lead from a place of purpose and with humanity. And I wanted to offer you know, help and tools and practical advice and concrete stories about what it takes to do this because I feel I've learned so much. So I hope Hubert, that it will be helpful from that standpoint. Hubert, where, you know, you're a, a, a little bit ahead of me in, in years, but even for me, I always struggled when I first came into the business world because it was so about you have to have sharp elbows. Don't let anybody walk all over you. It was very masculine, and not even masculine, that's unfair. Actually, I wanna take a step back because for a long time I would always say I had these skills that my mom gave me. I'm like my mom, they're feminine skills. When I was in my 20s, 30s, now it's just human skills, like compassion, empathy. There's unlimited men with that. It's not, there's unlimited women with you know, alpha, ultra. Like, you know, so I think that, that's a misconception, but even 
even taking it a step back, I always struggled with that because I didn't, I thought I was a killer. I really did. I thought I was a businessman killer. But I didn't think it had to be, I thought of business like sports. Meaning, when I was doing business, I wanted to win. The most competitive, I still am. I want to build the biggest. But, but when I would meet a competitor at a restaurant or meet a competitor at a conference, I had the ability to look at them as a human being and say, you know, do I want to beat her? Do I want to beat him? Oh, of course. But I'm surprised by how many people in business are nasty, are spending their time trying to tear down the other person. Because I've always looked at business like sports. You could be nasty on the field, but when the game is over, you come up to the person, you say, how's your wife? Uh, Can I make a donation to your charity? I saw that you posted that the other day. Oh man, you really got me today. I'm gonna get you next time. And I don't think people, and I think the term business is business is a negative term. It's like, but I actually think it's a very true term, but I wanna spin it and make it a little bit like, you see where I'm going and that's why I'm oh using sports. It's Please. It's so profound what you're saying and you make me think of my good friend, Jim Citrin, who is one of the senior guys at Spencer Stewart, who many years ago wrote something very profound, which is the best leaders don't climb to the top. They are carried to mm. the top. One of the diseases in the world other than COVID is the idea of zero sum games. Mm-hmm. The only way for you, Gary, to win is if I lose. Tell them. Vice versa. That's right. That's crazy. I think we have to step back and think about why do we work? You know, what, you know and, and work is such an important part of our life. So it's, a, it's an important question. Is work a curse, a punishment because some dude sent in paradise? Uh, or is it something that you do so that you can do something else that's more fun, like, if you're in Minnesota, having the Vikings beat the Green Bay Packers. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, if you follow the Lebanese poet Khalil Gibran, is work, love made visible? Is work, love made visible? Yes. And I think it is. It's part of our fulfillment as human beings. And wh- why do I speak about this in connection with business? Because I see a company as a human organization made of individuals working together in pursuit of a goal, not a money-making machine, a human organization made of individuals working together in pursuit of a goal. And then you ask yourself, what is the goal? And that's why you have to look inside during the lockdown, right? If you couldn't go outside, go inside. And I think at the heart of every human being is a desire to do something good in the world. And the good thing in business- If, if, my friend, if, and I don't know you, if they were fortunate enough to have the foundation you know, my mother, like I'm so happy, grateful, content that my ability to do good for the world is unlimited because I'm not searching for anything for myself. That's right. I, I think that a lot of people are unable to do good for the world because they're hurting themselves. If you're hurting, it's impossible for you yes. to do for others. You're so yes. self-consumed. Yes. However, I believe one of the reasons, you know, I've always believed I mean, I'm, listen, I'm pretty like socially like accepting and love and blah, 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 blah. But I've always believed in the power of business. And, and I believe that one of the great ways to be selfless is to be selfish. And that's why I've always felt that business, and that's why the, you, the fact that you, you, you did say in the subtitle the word capitalism, right? You yep. said that. Yep. See, that really caught my attention. That was probably the final piece when we were talking. Yep. I remember it now, because I was on the, on the in Malibu driving on this highway. It's such a negative word to so many and I think it doesn't, does not have to be. That's right. And I think what you're trying to do and what I'm trying to do, if we rewrite it, because I believe that I am, in, I am making and I expect for the next 50 years to make such a profound legacy using business and capitalism as the engine to good, not the reverse. That's exactly right. And one of the things, by the way, you said, Gary, is about winning. And so in business, of course we want to do well, but one of the things I've learned is uh, in order to win, you know, how do I define winning? I now doesn't, I do not define winning as being number one. So at Best Buy, we, you know, people thought in 2012 when I became the CEO that Amazon was going to kill us, right? Yes. And everybody talks about that. And uh, 
in strategy, I actually don't believe that I need to define my strategy as beating Amazon. It's about being the best company I can be. And there's room for different types of players. In fact, from a strategic standpoint, it's better if I build something that's completely unique. And the irony in the, in the saga with Amazon, who was supposed to kill us, is we did neutralize them because, you know, at Best Buy, we made sure we had the same prices, uh, same- Let's start right there. Let's start right there. Yeah. I love that you started with that. I, in both my core businesses, both. And, and there's a lot of different people listening here and that's, and I'm sorry to interrupt. I know people get frustrated with me, but I, I have a style and I want people- I love to the intensity. Things. Thank Stop you, my friend. Stop interrupting me when I'm interrupting you. <laughs> you know, it's exactly right, right? Like, but you said something very important. I believe the number one reason incumbents lose to new variables in retail is their ideology around price. You said it so subtly, which is why I jumped in. Both my businesses, my dad's wine store and my advertising agency have thrived on price. It is very difficult to tell a person why they should pay more on a commodity. It is incredibly hard, right? Yep. To say, hey, hey, Paul, you should pay more at Best Buy than on Amazon uh, because we, because we have many stores and more overhead. Because we, <laughs> because we will talk you through it here on the floor. I'm, I'm sure when you walked in, the frustration, I mean, I saw it during that era. People yep. would come to Best Buy and other retailers, do their homework, and by the time they were out of the store and in the parking lot, had bought it in a re- an online retailer for less price. Your decision to not let them outprice you, how much was that resistant by CFOs and short-term financial people, how big of a fight or non-fight? Tell me a few minutes on that story. I know it's off topic, but it's not off topic for the people that are listening to this podcast, so I wanna spend two minutes on it, my friend. Yeah, and the the journey, so back in 2012, right, it was called showrooming, what you just described, and and I I spent my first week uh, at Best Buy working in a store in St. Cloud, Minnesota, so that I could listen from and learn from the frontliners and see what was going on. And why the showrooming phenomenon was not completely widespread, it was happening. And stepping back, I said, look, I, you know, I want, to, I want to win with the customers. There's no logical argument for uh, preventing the customers from doing this. So I'm going to pri- take price off the table. Now, we did study, we had done a pilot, we had quantified the price gap. So, and then the question was, you know, uh, what's our choice, right? We can continue to carry a price premium and die slowly, or we can align our prices, win with the customers in our own way, and then we'll have to fund, you know, the investment in price. We quantified it, we funded it through efficiencies, and also we found we, we, we were able to think outside the box. And again, avoiding zero-sum games, and that was the partnerships we did with the, the world's foremost tech companies that opened stores within our stores, you know, which helped us offset our yep. higher cost structure. And so, you know, the, these principles of being focused on the customers, neutralizing Amazon, but then trying to become the best version of Best Buy by, by trying to think through what are the unique problems that our customers have and what are the unique ways that we at Best Buy can use to solve them uh, and, and win that way. And uh, so that was our, our, our focus and that what explains the, the resurgence of Best Buy. And then that led us to actually cooperate with Amazon because we sell their products in our stores. And then we even did the deal where they gave us the exclusive rights to the Fire TV platform to be embedded in, in, I remember. in our TVs, which was huge, with crazy huge. So, so it was a different way to think I want to refuse a big lesson, Gary, that you and I, I think shares. Refuse zero sum games. That's the difference maybe with, with sports. In the Super Bowl, there's only one winner. In sports, yes. all of us can win if we play a different game. We have to well, play there's, game than there, anybody else. There, to your point, there's another layer to this conversation where I'm fascinated, which is for me, the process is the winning, not the numbers or the money. For me, I'm winning every single day. Like if, if you said, actually, I'm not this great executive and author, I'm actually a genie from the future, 
and I came on this podcast, Gary, to tell you your future, and I have some bad news. Today is actually the apex height of your professional career financially, that you will never earn more, you will never earn more notoriety, influence, legacy, this is it, this is the moment. Literally starting tomorrow, unfortunately something's gonna happen and you're gonna not collapse but you're gonna flatten out and literally my answer to you would be like, but am I still playing? Like do I still have businesses? And you'd say yes. I would be smiling cheek to cheek. I think the winning for, you know, is the process. Definitely for entrepreneurs, I have more compassion that it's a slightly different game for gentlemen and women like yourself where there's boards and the market, where there's variables of time limit. You know, what's great about being an entrepreneur is you're playing for life. There is a little bit of, you know, if I was the CEO of HP or Best Buy or Dunkin' Donuts, there would be an inherent understanding in my mind I don't control all the variables and at some point here, others may innuendo to me, even if I do a great job for 12 years, hey, the next person's ready, she wants to leave if she doesn't get your job, we're gonna need you to be executive chairman and I would understand that. But I, but I do think the people, both executives and entrepreneurs that fall in love with the process are winning on a daily basis. Thoughts? Yeah, and I think the way I, I would describe it, it's all about how we define winning and it's all about purpose and meaning. For me. So the fundamental question for all of us as leaders is who are we? How do we want to be remembered? What legacy do we want to leave? What's the meaning of our life? In fact, one of the exercise, uh, exercises I have, uh, so I coach CEOs and I mentor them or at Harvard Business School, we have this new CEO program. We ask them to write down their retirement speech or even better, their eulogy. So what really gives you energy, what drives you? And I think if we can connect our work activities with what drives us, which for most people is doing good things to other people, right? Then that's the definition of living a meaningful life. And when I think about my life, I wanna, I've always used three criteria, right? I wanna do something that's meaningful, that's impactful, and that's joyful. And to your point, it's the journey, right? Now, I do believe that Life is about growth, right? That's the definition of life. And so whether, but you can define growth in many different terms. And the late uh, Clay Christensen, right, uh, wrote this book about how will you measure your life? And you get to decide this. And I think as leaders, this may be some of the most important questions. What's, what, you know, what is meaningful to us? And by the way, one of the things I've learned, uh, Gary, at Best Buy is being curious about what drives people around you and really understanding their life story, what gives them joy, what gives them energy. I had a, I had a store general manager in Boston. He would ask every one of the associates of his store, in his store, about 100 of them, right? What is your dream? Hmm. At Best Buy or outside of Best Buy, what is your dream? Write it down in the break room. My job as the store GM is to help you achieve your dream. Now that's meaning. And to paraphrase Godfather, you know, tell Michael I actually liked him. It was only business, nothing personal. I think <laughs> business needs to be personal. You know, yep. and, and, and that's a huge shift. And to me, that's the heart of business. It's placing people at the center and finding ways to unleash human magic, you know, not only in ourselves, but in everybody around us and everybody at the company. This is when you get how, extraordinary how, results in me. How, how do you think about firing? I think a lot of people are listening to this might yes. get some great value out of your perspective. How do you yes. think of the process of, you've, you've obviously have fired many people through your career, it's the nature of the game. You know, how, or, or am I making assumptions, no? So, so, so let me say a few things Please. on this. Please. It's very different uh, from the top of the house to you know, the, 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 the front liners and so forth. When I studied at Best Buy, it, it was a- I'm sorry, real quick, I, I apologize. My, but you didn't start as CEO. I did, at the Best Buy I did. I know that, I'm sorry, I'm trying to take your whole career yeah. into account. Yeah. I'm talking about you the human more yeah. so than Best Buy. Yeah. As you went through your journey, you've obviously had to go through that difficult process of letting people go, yes? Yes. So, so I think for me, you the CEO of Best Buy, and, and you know, as a fan of sports and business, 
that victory is a big one because to your point, when, when I saw that on paper, I'm like, this is gonna be hard. But I'm actually, you're actually on this podcast because I'm more interested in you, the human being, the whole part. Yes. I think we, so for me, take me, how about even maybe the story of the first person you had ever, you know, for me, I'll tell you, I'll share something vulnerable. I used to have to ask my father to, to fire people because I disliked it so much. Yeah. Uh, you know, so just curious for you yeah. as somebody who's emotionally, intelligently charged, comes from a place of humanity. Yeah. It took me only into my last couple of years where I'm like, oh no, this is not, I'm doing, I'm not doing them a favor by them staying here. Yeah. It's better, you know, but it, it, I didn't really believe it in my yeah. 30s. I'm starting to believe it more now. There's a way to do kind candor to get them there. Yes. I'm just curious about your journey with firing. Yes. So several things. One uh, at the macro level, when you need to improve the performance of the company, one of the beliefs I've developed is that f- reducing headcount is a last resort, which is the opposite of the usual playbook. Company announces restructuring, 10,000 positions eliminated, share price goes up. I think that's horrendous. The priorities are grow the revenue. If you're going to cut, cut cost, first focus on non salary expenses which is all of the elements of the cost structure that have nothing to do with people, which is usually the bulk of the cost structure, and treat headcount reduction as a last resort. Because usually people are not the problem, to paraphrase Ronald Reagan. People are the solution. You know, They're the engine. That's at the, at the macro level. At the micro level, so just one individual. Um, you're right. The, uh, what you find is that uh, sometimes people are not a good fit. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, they, they may not have the joy in the job, or it's not a good fit for their skills. They're struggling. Everybody knows they're struggling. Now, if it's the case in the junior position, then you help them grow. But at the top of the house, you know, it's too costly to have the wrong executive. I'm a big believer. I'm a bit of a Maoist, so don't report me to Senator <laughs> McCarthy, right? I believe that fish rot from the head. I agree. And oftentimes you have to quickly remove people who are not a good fit. And, uh, but you don't add insult to injury. You'd say, you know, let's talk. This is not a good fit. But, uh, you know, in your, as you look for your next opportunity, I'll support you. And so you have to have in your heart the fact that, A, it's a responsibility. You have to make sure that you have the right team at the top. Because then it influences not just one person but 100,000 people, and that's your responsibility. And then as it relates to the individual, you have a human conversation uh, around this, and that's a big, that's a big uh, uh, thing. Uh, and, and, you know, you have to make peace also with the fact that, uh, you know, you're the decision maker. And uh, it's not, it doesn't mean you're right. You don't, it doesn't mean you need to convince the person you're right, that they're wrong is that you're the decision maker and you've done your best to reach a conclusion and then you are going to do your best to execute the decision in, in, a, in a human way. There's no point in adding insult to injury. The common point in all of this is that the source of everything in business is people and uh, they're usually not the problem. If there's a misfit, then you have to deal with it but without adding insult to injury. I totally understand, my friend. What, um, what stood out for you in the book writing process? You know, for me, I'm writing a book that I think has got some similarities without reading it yet. As I told you, I wouldn't read the book because I'm not good at that. It's not how I comprehend, but I couldn't wait for this interview. What, when, I was, when I'm writing my current book, I was blown away by me realizing, wait a minute, I'm dramatically more curious than I realized. When you were writing this, what, what stood out for you of like maybe a trait or a nuance or a philosophy that you even had more conviction or more belief in or you maybe didn't even realize it's something about yourself or to the level, I always knew I was curious. I just don't think I knew I was this curious. And now a lot of things make sense. It's why I'm innovative. I'm curious. Yeah. And it's not something I talk a lot about but it will be you know, going forward. Yeah. Did anything stand out to you? Yes. First, it was a very uh, enjoyable process. So here's the scoop. Writing a book is actually not difficult, but writing a good book is extremely difficult. (laughs) So you need, uh, I needed some help and I worked with a wonderful partner, Callan 
Lambert, and uh, it was a very intensive process. We really worked well together. Uh, the, the, place, the piece that I enjoyed the most was writing the third part of the book, which is about unleashing human magic. The first part is about the meaning of work. The second part is about the purposeful human organization, what it means. The third part is about what it takes to unleash human magic, because I felt we had learned so much at Best Buy, but when you have to articulate something, uh, then you know it forces you to research and uh, be more precise. And I think this is, and the reason why I'm excited also about it is my daughter recently told me that's the part of the book that she likes best. And when a daughter tells her father something <laughs> especially meaningful, but it was a special moment. Good for you. And it's the ingredients about how, you know, what does it take at scale in particular to have everybody at the company to have a spring in their step, to be supercharged up about wanting to do great things in their work and for each other. And what does it take, which is the opposite of what I think we had learned last century. Last century, making, getting things done in business was about you know, following Bob McNamara, the former Secretary of Defense, who was the inventor of scientific top-down management, right? You took a bunch of smart people, they created a smart plan, an implementation plan, communicated it, put key performance indicators in place, put incentives in place. That doesn't work. And the reason is people don't like to be told what to do. Gary, do you like to be told what to do? I'm my friend, be, no. my friend, I got D's and F's through school mainly because I didn't like to be told what to do and mainly because I didn't respect a system that wasn't willing to react to the reality of my DNA. It's, it's why I find so many people lose in fighting in combat sports. The people that are most effective are the ones reacting to the energy far off than the ones that are driving it. And that's how I feel about life. You know, my, my entire career success is around humility. It doesn't look like that because I'm very convicted, I'm high energy, I'm aggressive, I'm competitive, but let there be no confusion. I only think the market is correct. I don't think, I always think they're right. Everything that, is, that I fail is 100% they were right, I was wrong. The audacity of the market's not ready for my genius and all this <laughs> bullshit I hear is ludicrous. The market is the market is the market. That's exactly right. And one of the other transformations, I think, in, uh, in business and in leadership, right? We, the, the, the leadership model of last century was the leader as the superhero who is there to save the day, has got all of the answers, often driven by power, fame, glory, and money. Eh, nobody wants to follow a leader like this. I think yeah. that the humidity, vulnerability, my most used phrase these days is, my name is Hubert, and I need help. And I'm curious about you know, what drives people around you. And I know my job is not to necessarily come up with the answers, but to create this environment in which everyone can blossom, they feel they can exist, they can be the biggest, most beautiful version of themselves. And that's a journey for so many of us because that's not how many of us were raised. I totally understand. Who, um, who through your career either intimately you saw or from the outside have you admired that you think captured the essence of this book? Uh, there's several people who've had a big influence in shaping it. Uh, and I'll mention maybe three of them. Uh, one was a client of mine at McKinsey and Company 30 years ago, Jean-Marie de Carpentry, who was the CEO of a French uh, computer company, who told me, Hubert, the purpose of a corporation is not to make money. It's an imperative, it's an, but it's an outcome, but it's not the goal. Uh, you know, it's the, uh, the profit is the consequence of having a great team, which leads you to have you know, great customers and innovation. Uh, and that's what you have to focus on. And one of the things he said is, you know, when you do your monthly business review, don't start with financial results and the meeting with financial results, but start with people and organization, customers, business, innovation, and end with financial results. And then Gary, around the same time, about 30 years ago, two friends of mine who are monks in a religious congregation invited me to work with them on writing a, a couple of articles on the theology and philosophy of work. 
which invited me to reflect on why do we work, right? This idea that work is part of our search for meaning, which was very influential. Uh, a third person, uh, when I was being interviewed to be the CEO of Calson Companies, which is another Minneapolis-based company that's in travel and hospitality. And so it's Marilyn Calson Nelson, and she's the daughter of the founder of the company. And, it was, and she was interviewing me to be potentially your successor. One of the questions she asked me is, Hubert, tell me about your soul. Tell hmm. me about your soul. That's the only time, Gary, anybody asked me that question. I love that. And you know, one of the things we've realized last year, certainly I've realized more than ever, is that uh, you know, the, the people around us are, <laughs> are not just employees, they're human beings, they're whole people, and we need to lead with all of our body parts, not just the brain, but also the heart, the soul, the guts, the ears, the eyes. And I used to spend, to place a lot of emphasis, emphasis when I would recruiting, be recruiting or promoting somebody on experience and expertise. I wanted the best e-commerce person, the best supply chain person. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, I spent time on, who is this person? What drives this person? How do they want to be remembered? I, I, I remember telling all of the officers at Best Buy when we were talking about leadership, I told them, look, if you're here to serve yourself or your boss or me, the CEO of the company, if you think you're serving me, it's okay. I don't have a problem with that. Except you cannot work here. We are going to promote you to a customer and we're going to take great care of you as a Best Buy customer because what I want is leaders who are here to serve others. Right, and the uh, best way to serve others is, is, as you said earlier, is to to start from within. Right, is to be somebody who's clear about who they are and then who cares about uh, about others, and don't have the sharp elbows. Right, that's not who we want. So these are some of the people who have influenced me today in business. I think there's great leaders that I admire. I think at Microsoft, Satya Nadella is a role model for me. He exemplified his vision of leadership is about role modeling, caring, and coaching. I think that's he's a great example. My good friend John Donahoe, the CEO of Nike. Mm -hmm. he, John, when he finished business school, he wrote down his retirement speech. Hmm. And he kept it with him. And he's constantly going back to uh, to that retirement speech to check in that you know he's living. He's, the he's on the idea yeah, that he set out. Yeah. These are examples. Um, these are real examples. I appreciate that. What, uh, what have we not touched on before we get out of here uh, that you want people to know about the book? And obviously the book's available on all platforms, I assume. Yeah, it's available on all platforms. It's really a book, you know, if I had wanted to write a book for CEOs, I would have gotten together, you know, the CEOs at the business council and uh, spoken with them for a couple of hours and would have been done. So this is a book for all leaders at all levels. Uh, and my view is that everyone is a leader because at the minimum we're leaders of our lives and leaders who are eager to create this future that does not exist yet, but that needs to be a more sustainable, more just future that, that deals with the number of ticking time bombs we have. And, you know, I've written it for you. Right. Ticking time uh, bombs on whether it's environmental or whether it's mental health or yeah. whether it's, a million other variables, if you yeah. actually used as much of your heart as you did your brain or your wallet, yeah. well, then you could have a much better mix around business. Yes? Exactly. And we can yeah, be a force for good. To. And this book is an invitation for all of us to, fit, you know, to define what impact we want to have in the world and how we can lead, do a better job. We're all trying, I think, today. Do a better job of leading from a place of purpose and with humanity. And it's, a, it's really a playbook, a guide, practical set of tools to help leaders, uh, fellow travelers who are moving in that uh, direction. So I hope it, it, it's helpful to folks. I appreciate you being on, my friend. I wish you nothing but success. I can't wait to buy a bunch of copies for friends. Gary, I hope this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. I promise you it is. <laughs> thank you. You do, Botcher. What's up? It's Gary Vee. First of all, thank you so much. I hope you're doing super well during these times. Uh, I also want to ask you, please subscribe because my commitment and exploration of YouTube is about to explode. Stories, polls, more content, more engagement, more surprise and delight. This 
is the time to subscribe. I hope you consider it and I hope I see you soon.